Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will continue my conversation on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. We are on chapter four, and this is the fourth video continuing chapter four. Now, as I had mentioned in my previous videos, and I do encourage you to watch them, in chapter four, Freire is articulating and explaining a praxis of revolution, right? Or trying to explain what constitutes a truly revolutionary movement, right? And uh, I find this chapter to be highly instructive because not only does it teach us how to change the world through revolutionary means, but it also offers what not to do if you claim to be a revolutionary leader or a revolutionary subject, right? That's what this book actually teaches us, how not to become oppressors ourselves if we attempt to change the, the order, the unjust order around us. So that's why this lesson is really crucial, but it's also important to read the other chapters before you get to it because everything is connected. So as always, I will first read the passages that I want to include in my discussion today and then go on and talk about them a little more. So let's read today's passages. It would indeed be idealistic to affirm that by merely reflecting on oppressive reality and discovering their status as objects, persons have thereby already become subjects. But while this perception in and of itself does not mean that thinkers have become subjects, it does mean, as one of my co-investigators affirmed, that they are subjects in expectation an expectancy which leads them to seek to solidify their new status. On the other hand, it would be a false premise to believe that activism, which is not true action, is the road to revolution. People will be truly critical if they live the plenitude of the praxis that is if their action encompasses a critical reflection which increasingly organizes their thinking and thus leads them to move from a purely naive knowledge of reality to a higher level, one which enables them to perceive the causes of reality. If revolutionary leaders deny this right to the people, they impair their own capacity to think or at least to think correctly. Revolutionary leaders cannot think without the people, nor for the people, but only with the people. The dominant elites, on the other hand, can and do think without the people. Although they do not permit themselves the luxury of failing to think about the people in order to know them better and thus dominate them more efficiently. Consequently, we any apparent dialogue or communication between the elites and the masses is really the depositing of communiques whose contents are intended to exercise a domesticating influence. Why do the dominant elites not become debilitated when they do not think with the people? Because the latter constitute their antithesis, their very reason of existence. If the elites were to think with the people, the contradiction would be suspended and they could no longer dominate. From the point of view of dominators in any epoch, correct thinking presupposes the non-thinking of the people. Quote, a Mr. Giddy, later president of the Royal Society, raised objections which could be matched in every country. However specious in theory the project might be of giving education to the laboring classes of the poor, it would be prejudicial to their morals and happiness. It would teach them to despise their lot in life instead of making them good servants in agricultural and other laborious employments. 
Instead of teaching them subordination, it would render them fractious and refractory, as was evident in the manufacturing counties. It would enable them to read seditious pamphlets, vicious books, and publications against Christianity. It would render them insolent to their superiors, and in, in a few years the legislature would find it necessary to direct the strong arm of power against them. What Mr. Giri really wanted, and what the elites of today want, although they do not denounce popular education so cynically and openly, was for the people not to think. Since the Mr. Giddies of all epochs, as an oppressive class, cannot think with the people, neither can they let people think for themselves. The same is not true, however, of revolutionary leaders. If they do not think with the people, they become devitalized. The people are their constituent matrix, not mere objects thought of. Although revolutionary leaders may also have to think about the people in order to understand them better, this thinking differs from what that of the elite. For in thinking about the people in order to liberate rather than dominate them, the leaders give of themselves to the thinking of the people. One is the thinking of the master, the other is the thinking of the comrade. So let us unpack these passages. The distinction is still the same as he has discussed in the previous novels, the distinction between reflection and activism, right? Because what he's trying to highlight here is that reflection without action, you know, is mere a practice in thinking because it doesn't have any action involved in it. But similarly, action without reflection is what he calls mere activism. So in order for us to be truly revolutionary subjects, we must reflect on the world around us, right? And then take some necessary actions to change it. These two combined create a praxis, right? That's really crucial. Just standing somewhere and raising a flag doesn't make you into a revolutionary or doesn't change the world, right? It sometimes actually just helps the powers that be that they create a space for you to go and be an activist and you just go do that and feel good about it without having affected any change. So reflection, critical reflection about the world and about our own place in it plus positive action must come together, and that's what he's talking about in the first lines of this paragraph. Now, the co-worker that he mentions um, uh, is, you know, Fernando Garcia, right, who also researched on the same topics, right? So, where he says that my co-investigator affirmed that they are subject in expectancy, that even if people have not fully been transformed if they have started thinking about change, right? We can't just merely assume that they have become fully realized subjects, but they have become subjects in expectancy because they are now thinking about the world in which they live, critically thinking about the world. Now remember in the previous chapters, we have, we have reached that point. We have discussed these things. How does that happen? Right, what is involved in that, and, and critical pedagogy, of course, is a part of it. And then he, basically what he's highlighting is that the reason the dominant elite are the dominant elite is because they separate the people from themselves. They think of themselves as the leaders and people as this other that needs to be subjugated, that needs to be controlled. And if revolutionary leaders also have the same kind of mindset, if they also think that they are there to lead and people must follow, then nothing much will change because they'll just replace another oppressive order with their own presence under the garb of calling themselves revolutionary leaders. I mean, that's what happened in Soviet Union. That's what the Communist Party of China is. You cannot have a revolutionary elite that controls the people. They must speak with the people, right? 
that is crucial. They must remain part of the people. Now, what else he discusses in these passages, there is a long quote where, which is attributed to a Mr. Giddy, right? Now, that is coming from the work of Reinhard, Reinhold Niebuhr, right? Reinhold Niebuhr was an American theologian, and the book that um, Freire is citing from is his 1960 book called Moral Man and Immoral Society. And this paragraph basically, Naipur is basically saying here are some of the objections mounted to when we talk about educating the poor, right? That, that these people, the Mr. Giddies of the world, will then posit that, oh no, if we give people too much knowledge, they will become critical, they will start questioning the faith, they will start questioning the system. And so the knowledge of the world, the education of the world, is seen or posited as a threat. And so, hence, Freire says what Mr. Giddy really wanted was for the people not to think. Since the Mr. Giddies of all epochs cannot think with the people, neither can they let the people think for themselves. So the idea is, what he's saying is that the dominant groups would rather give you a kind of education which doesn't encourage you to think your own life within it, right? Because if you don't think critically of your world, you're not going to start developing a praxis of changing it. And we've already learned through Freire that the banking system of education does that, right? It just makes us into these recipients of knowledge who go and reproduce it. The famous Macaulay's Minute on Indian education, that they should be able to compute and they should be able to write, but that's all we want from them because then we can keep them as colonized subjects. The purpose here is what he's trying to highlight in the passages that I read is that mere reflection is not enough, mere action is not enough, and Reflection and action must come together to develop a praxis. And within that, the dichotomy of leaders versus people is not going to be revolutionary. Leaders must not act as top-down leaders who give guidance to the people. They must rather be like fellows, like comrades. So a community of equals, where the leaders think with the people, act with the people, and constantly center the people. Now remember, people here is not a monolith, and this is not an ill-informed group of people. People that he's imagining are also the people who have gone through the revolutionary education, who have developed a reflected praxis, right? So we can't just capture the people at where they are, where they, are, they have already internal, internalized the previous logic of oppression. No, these are people who are already on the way to liberating themselves. So keep that in mind. There is no romanticized view of the people here. It's the people who have already been mobilized, right? Who have already learned what their world is, what's their place in it, and that the world is unjust. So it's those people along with the leaders, right, who come together to form this revolutionary movement. So these are some of my thoughts on it. I will now read uh, a couple of other passages and then conclude my conversation. Domination, by its very nature, requires only a dominant pole and a dominated pole in antithetical contradiction. Revolutionary liberation which attempts to resolve this contradiction implies the existence not only of these poles, but also of a leadership group which emerges during this attempt. This leadership group either identifies itself with the oppressed state of the people, or it is not revolutionary. To simply think about the people as the dominators do, without any self-giving in the thought, to fail to think with the people is a sure way to cease being revolutionary leaders. 
In the process of oppression, the elites subsist on the living death of the oppressed and find their authentication in the vertical relationship between themselves and the latter. In the revolutionary process, there is only one way for the emerging leaders to achieve authenticity. They must die in order to be reborn through and with the oppressed. We can legitimately say that in the process of oppression, someone oppresses someone else. We cannot say that in the process of revolution, someone liberates someone else, nor yet that someone liberates himself, but rather that human beings in communion liberate each other. This affirmation is not meant to undervalue the importance of revolutionary leaders, but on the contrary, to em emphasize their value. What could be more important than to live and work with the oppressed, with the rejects of life, with the wretched of the earth? In this communion, the revolutionary leaders should find not only their raison d'etre, but a motive for rejoicing. By their very nature, revolutionary leaders can do what the dominant elites, by their very nature, are unable to do in authentic terms. Every approach to the oppressed by the elites as a class is couched in terms of the false generosity described in chapter 1. But the revolutionary leaders cannot be falsely generous, nor can they manipulate. Whereas the oppressor elites flourish by trampling the people underfoot, the revolutionary leaders can flourish only in communion with the people. Thus it is that the activity of the oppressor cannot be humanist, while that of the revolutionary is necessarily so. The inhumanity of the oppressor and re revolutionary humanism both make use of science. But science and technology at the service of the former are used to reduce the oppressed to the status of things. At the service of the latter, they are used to promote humanization. The oppressed must become subjects of the latter process. However, lest they continue to be seen as mere objects of scientific interest. So once again, it becomes quite evident by what I just read is that there is a certain kind of leadership that Freire is talking about. Now he's already taught us and we have learned through our reading that the domination is a sort of a thing in which there is a dominant group and there is an oppressed group. That dichotomy is strictly maintained. Now, in the process of revolution, what he is saying is that, of course, a, an, a leadership group will emerge in the process of revolution. But this leadership group cannot model itself on the earlier model of domination. It cannot distinguish between itself and the people. This group, in the last instance, must be determined by its intimate connection to the people. And not connection to liberate them, no, but to work in concert with the people. And that is the most important thing to keep in mind. Because if this group also starts thinking about the previous dominant group where it says, we know what's in your interest. Let us fight this. Remember in chapter 3 we had talked about it, right, where it, the saying that let's delay it until the revolution is done and then we will declare everyone open. No, that is a replication of the older model because people are still seen as objects, right? The humanity in Freire isn't just that physically we are all human. Of course we are. The humanity, a fully realized human, is someone who has a voice, who has agency, and who can participate in his or her own liberation or in the decisions that are made for them. And that's crucial for revolutionary leadership, not to try to liberate people, but to try to define themselves with the people, right? So that's why these phrases are really crucial. This affirmation is not meant to undervalue the importance of revolutionary leaders, but on the contrary, to emphasize their values. What could be more important than to live and work with the oppressed, 
with the rejects of life, with the wretched of the earth. So the revolutionary leaders then cannot be an elite. They cannot detach themselves from the people, right? They cannot model themselves on the earlier oppressive order. They must define themselves with the people. And then the, towards the end of the paragraph, he's going to, thus it is that the activity of the oppressor cannot be humanist. We already know that. While that of the revolutionary is necessarily so, right? And then in the next chapter, now next section of this chapter, he is going to what he calls the scientific humanism. But this idea of studying the people as objects of study is part of the oppressive model. I mean, think of all the sociologists who do that, who go and study a people, right? But they are very careful to not to get invested too much on the people because they need to keep their objectivity, right? That's not going to work because then you're still studying the people as an object of study and not getting what you call getting your hands dirty, right? Or as Derrida would say, is getting your hands caught up in the act of doing something. So these are some of the thoughts uh, so far in Chapter 4. As I mentioned in the previous videos also, Freire, after having explained to us that the purpose of education is to, to enable all of us to claim our humanity, to disrupt and change the, the oppressive system, to then develop a curriculum in which the oppressed have a voice, in which they inform the method of learning. And then after we have done that, to develop a revolutionary praxis aimed at creating a world in which everyone can live without oppression, right? With their full humanity expressed freely. And in this chapter, in chapter four, he is articulating the praxis of that praxis, right? That's why I always say that to all my Marxist and leftist friends, you can't just read Marx and Gramsci and Althusser and, and Lenin and devise a strategy of revolutionary change. We all have to learn what Freire is teaching us here because this is not just a book about critical pedagogy. This is not about teaching. This is a teaching geared towards changing the world in making it more just and equal for everyone. That is why, in my opinion, pedagogy of, of the oppressed is probably the most important book for anyone interested in changing the world and making it a better place for everyone to live. So that's it on chapter four from me so far. Uh, I will come back for the next section of the chapter and hopefully in the next few months I would have concluded this long journey into reading and sharing my understanding of pedagogy of the oppressed with you. If you have any questions, any concerns, please send them my way and do let me know what you think. And as always, your comments are always welcome. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so, so that you get timely notifications. We are still in the middle of a pandemic, and uh, I hope you're taking care of yourself and those around you. Please continue to do so. I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.